So today we are very happy to have Ian Molt, who will tell us about conformal colliders uh, and how they meet the LHC. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be talking about, in particular, this topic uh, to this audience. And so today I'm going to tell you about some recent work with a number of people uh, over the last little while on trying to make this kind of conformal collider setup, which was kind of um, proposed by uh, Hoffman and Malasina quite a while ago, actually kind of meet the real world in, and in particular uh, the LHC. And so I should say that I'm obviously much less formal than many of the uh, speakers, particularly in the last few weeks. But my hope is that I can convince you that this has some interesting relations with things that people there are working on and um, at the very least show you some kind of nice pictures of these um, LH or these energy correlators in the real world LHC. Okay, so my interest in this subject kind of got, um, began with kind of real concrete, very practical uh, real world problems, namely looking at collisions at the LHC. And so when you collide things at the LHC, what the experimentalist off at infinity has to do is to measure kind of patterns in the radiation. And in particular in this talk, I'll focus on energy and to measure kind of patterns in the energy at infinity to understand what's going on in the underlying collision. And so you can do very concrete things much like you do in the CMB and measure for instance, three point correlation functions of the um, energy flow at infinity. And so the reason why one wants to do this is not just to study, for example, QCD or kind of the dynamics of the events, but it actually kind of was motivated by very concrete, um, this area of jet substructure, where one tries to understand the flow of energy within jets to understand if, for instance, new particles were produced in the collision. So you can imagine you might produce in your collision some new particle, which here I've shown as this massive uh, pink blob. And this could be some actual new physics or just something like the Higgs. And if it decays purely into hadrons, you have no way of kind of seeing it because you can't see this big pink blob. And so the only imprint that it leaves is some imprint on the kind of energy flow um, that you see in your detector. And so if it's some kind of massive particle, it will behave differently in the imprint that you see in the energy flow than just standard um, QCD jets. And so just to show that this isn't just kind of a picture, again, the details really do not matter at all. But this is just some kind of limit that comes from the actual CMS experiment on some new uh, particles using exactly this technique. And in particular, it really uses measurements of this um, three point correlation of energy flow. And so this is something which is kind of very widely done and has kind of very practical um, wide ranging purposes at the LHC. And so from a field theory perspective, what are you actually doing when you're doing this? What you're doing is studying um, kind of matrix elements of what can be called either energy flow or ANEC or light ray operators, depending on the particular audience. And so these can really be thought of depending on um, kind of your background um, as either kind of concrete calorimeter cells just placed off at infinity or as these kind of light ray operators shown here in this Penrose diagram. Um, and so just very, the kind of definition of these operators can be written um, just like this shown here. And so what you really do is just take your stress energy tensor um, you dot it into some direction, you move it off to infinity, and then you integrate it over time. And so this really has a direct correspondence with a kind of concrete calorimeter cell in the experiment, which is of course why this is interesting for understanding the LHC. And so what one then wants to measure and understand are these correlation functions of a number of these energy flow operators, which if you had all of them would completely characterize the kind of state at infinity. Okay, so these, from a field theory perspective, these are also interesting because they kind of take an intermediate position between amplitudes and correlation functions. And so that means that we'll ultimately be able to use techniques coming from kind of both um, sides. And so in particular, I mean, both amplitudes and correlation functions are extremely well studied. And the kind of reason that people like them is, for example, for amplitudes, they involve asymptotic states. And so they're of course relevant for these um, collider um, experiments, because what you want are a description of the asymptotic states. But they have the downside that they're kind of IR, or they're not IR finite, and so you have to, um, of course, they're still interesting objects, but they're not exactly what you actually observe physically. And so on the other hand, you have correlation functions, which are IR finite, since I generally talk in a perturbative language or non-perturbatively well-defined, might be another way of saying it. 
But these, although they're of course very interesting for many purposes, are not what you want for collider experiments because they don't involve asymptotic states. And so the kind of nice thing about these energy correlators is that they're kind of the meeting in the middle where they both involve these asymptotic states and they're real kind of IR finite observables. And so despite this kind of very clear um, and physical importance, they're much less explored than their amplitude or correlation function counterparts. I think this is definitely true in general, but the exception uh, for this audience um, is, should be clear. And so these objects are of course kind of very interesting in their own right, but what makes it even perhaps more interesting uh, to me is that the situations of interest at the LHC, which I showed earlier in these kind of jet substructure pictures, are not kind of generic configurations where these light ray operators are just randomly at any angle. And so the thing that's quite interesting about what you actually want these for in the real world is that um, these light ray operators are in a configuration in this so-called OPE or small angle limit where they're all brought together at very small angles. And so just if you like actual numbers, I'll, which I'll show in plots later, you can think of them as being at like 10 to the minus two or 10 to the minus one radians. So they're really, really um, brought to small angles because you have very high boosts at the LHC. And so of course, in these very small angle limits, you don't expect them to behave kind of generically. And so in particular, you expect them to have some kind of universal behavior, which is generically what you have in quantum field theory as you bring operators together. You expect some kind of scaling or universal scaling uh, behavior. And so this perspective was proposed in this um, very well-known paper, um, Conformal Collider Physics, where they argued, first of all, that there should be an OPE between these light ray operators, which in particular gives rise to scaling behavior in the energy, or in, sorry, in the angle, as you bring these light ray operators um, together and apart. And secondly, they argue that a kind of very nice way of understanding the energy flow in jets at small angles was to use the kind of symmetry and OPE structure of these light ray operators living on the um, kind of sphere at infinity or detector to understand the small angle behavior. And in particular that it should just be or governed largely by these um, universal scaling laws from the OPE. And so this paper, of course, as many people here know, had a very large impact, particularly on the CFT community in emphasizing the importance of um, these Lorentzian observables for understanding um, the structure of the CFT and has been much developed um, by these authors here into kind of a rigorous um, OPE. But unfortunately there was very little um, interest from the kind of non CFT um, community. And so the goal of this talk is to kind of describe how progress in understanding um, jet substructure or jets at the LHC over the last number of years really allows one to now just kind of, you can use this way of thinking in real world QCD, and then you can just go and directly measure um, these correlators and all their associated light ray scaling, um, et cetera, et cetera, inside these high energy jets at the LHC. And so I'll of course explain this more in detail later, but you can just kind of take some correlator shown here and you can scale it with size and you get these very nice kind of scaling relations, which as I described are exactly as predicted by the light ray OPE. And then at higher points, these behave like um, correlation functions. So in particular, a three point correlator will behave, um, will depend on two cross ratios, just like a four point uh, uh, correlation function of local operators. And so you'll be able to really just go in and measure also this like shape uh, or the scale independent um, shape piece, which is the function of the cross ratios. And so you can really just um, measure these and understand them in the real world uh, colliders. And so the, these energy correlators in this light ray OPE, um, they're not just kind of a nice theory playground for understanding the structure of these Lorentzian observables, but they're really actually a kind of um, a very practical way of thinking about energy flow in jets at the LHC. And also what's very exciting for me is that once you rephrase kind of measurements at the LHC in terms of these correlation functions in OPE, you can then of course take advantage of um, all the sof very sophisticated CFT techniques that have been being developed in recent years. And so I should say, of course, that when I show these things for QCD, it will be at a much lower level of sophistication than the very high powered CFT techniques. But alternatively, that can be phrased in a kind of a positive way that you have a lot of um, progress that can be made um, to really kind of um, reshape how one understands these real world uh, collisions. Okay. So with that as a hopefully motivating that these objects are interesting in the real world, as an outline of my talk, 
So obviously to understand what you're actually gonna um, expect to see at the, in QCD, you have to first um, uh, consider the kind of explicit structure of the light ray OPE in QCD and just see exactly what operators are there in the real world case. And so this turns out to actually be kind of um, interesting because it turns out that the OPE coefficients in QCD are quite non-generic. And so in particular, um, you'll find that in the matching, the OPE coefficients for operators with transverse spin are highly suppressed. And so although this is kind of a simple exercise, kind of just working through it explicitly, it actually tells you quite a bit about the physics of what you can expect to see at the LHC. So then once the kind of predictions or of what you can expect to see at the LHC are worked out, then I'm gonna go through and just kind of show you how you can actually observe all these things in the real world um, LHC data and show you some hopefully nice plots of these scaling behaviors and of the shapes of these correlators. And then um, one thing that this will motivate is trying to understand the perturbative structure of higher point correlators. So unfortunately, the only perturbative data is for two point correlators. And so it's strong coupling. These are the correlators are known for any N from this paper of uh, the original conformal collider physics paper. But um, obviously that is quite different than the real world. And so I'll discuss the perturbative structure of this um, three point correlator uh, shown here, just in perturbative, either in both in QCD and N equals four. And then how that tells you kind of interesting or gives you interesting data about the um, structure of the light ray OPE and kind of a data mine for playing with it at least perturbatively. Okay. So the leading twist um, QCD light ray OPE. So as I mentioned earlier in CFTs, this light ray OPE is a convergent and rigorous expansion, which was developed in particular in a number of papers by these authors. And so the thing that's extremely nice for the real um, world, as I said, is that because you're focused on the extreme small angle behavior, you can essentially for phenomenological purposes, at least to describe the leading scaling behavior, you can just restrict to the leading operators which appear in this OPE. And so because of this, in this section, I'll take an extremely pedestrian approach. And so it won't involve any of the high powered uh, machinery that these people developed. And so here, I just want to emphasize what the structure of the twist two light ray OPEs or what the structure of the twist two light ray operators are in QCD, just because you need to understand them explicitly to see what you'll see at the LHC and um, just discuss a little bit their OPE structure. Okay, so. The twist two operators in QCD are characterized by a spin J and a transverse spin J equals zero or two. So those are the only ones that you have at weak coupling. And so the local operators are just shown here. So these should be familiar to everyone. And so there's two transverse spin zero operators which correspond to quarks and gluons. And then there's a transverse spin uh, two operators which is purely gluonic. And I can just project it onto some uh, helicities as shown here. And so these can be transformed to obtain the twist two light ray operators, which are can kind of conveniently put in a kind of vector like this and are just characterized by this um, spin J parameter. And so because in uh, weak coupling, you only have spin J equals zero or two at leading twist, I'll refer to these as unpolarized for the spin zero and polarized for the J equals two. And so then as was emphasized in this paper by Hoffman and Malasina, this is extremely nice because you only have these four operators. And so all the leading scaling behavior is just determined um, by them. And so because this is a, and in particular by their renormalization group evolution. And so I should just say, because this is QCD will be our, prim or our primary target, it is not a conformal field theory. And so you don't get a pure scaling. You actually have to solve the RGE with the running coupling, but this will be a, a minor detail, which I, I won't dwell too much on. Okay. So to understand what you'll actually see at the LHC, you have to work out the explicit OPE coefficients. And so they're shown here for this um, OPE between two energy, energy correlators where you get this O3 um, vector of operators with spin three. And then this, um, to be able to iterate it, you also need this OPE of a spin J, one of these twist two library operators with this um, energy flow operator. And so these can be conveniently packaged in some matrix. The structure doesn't really matter. Its entries are just some harmonic sums of, of uh, which are analytic functions of J. And so the one thing that comes out of this, which is um, perhaps a little bit surprising, 
is these OPE coefficients into um, polarized operators. So the polarized operators appearing in this um, OPE of two anic operators are highly suppressed. And so this has become because you get opposite signs for contributions from gluons and fermions. So in particular, in QCD, you'll get a contribution that goes like CA minus NF, where NF is the number of fermions. And so if you did this in N equals four, I didn't write down the result with NS, but you in fact there get that it's exactly zero. And so you at leading twist do not see this um, transverse spin two operator. And so I'll show an explicit result later for how uh, suppressed this actually turns out to be. And so this kind of gives, will actually turn out to be fairly important for understanding what you expect to see at the LHC. And so once you have these explicit um, OPE data, what one can just work out is what you expect to see at the LHC. And so here I'll just focus on two particular things, which are kind of consequences of these. So the first is that the unpolarized operators will exhibit a kind of very clear scaling quite similar to what you expect in a CFT. And so we'll be able to actually just really observe these in LHC data by eye um, very nicely. And then the second, which is the one I just mentioned, is that these transverse spin two operators are highly suppressed. And so they will not, or we will not be able to see them um, by eye or very easily in the data, but they'll play an important role later, um, obviously in the consistency of the OPE. Okay. So the first most basic thing you can just do is to look at these, um, the behavior. So since the LHC has unpolarized beams, the most basic thing you can do is just measure these correlators in some um, jet like shown here. And so if you do this, what you'll do is just probe the transverse spin um, J equals zero operators. And so schematically, what will happen is exactly like in a CFT, where from doing this OPE, these endpoint correlators leading scaling will be determined by the twist two spin n plus one anomalous dimensions, which I'll denote like this. And so as you have more and more um, points, you can just think of these as reading off um, particular um, fixed spins in this Chu Frauchi plot. And so in particular, the scaling of, for example, this three point will be determined by this um, anomalous dimension gamma four uh, shown here. And so in particular, these kind of are convex, so gamma n plus one, is greater than gamma of n. And so um, it turns out experimentally that it's very um, convenient to take ratios of these to the two point correlator. So for example, if I take the scaling of the three point correlator over the two point correlator, it will go like theta to this difference of anomalous dimensions. And so if you plot what these look like, these will just be some curves and they get steeper and steeper as you, so this is like three over two, and then if you go four over two, they just get steeper and steeper uh, curves if you plot this in a CFT. So of course, this is a little um, schematic and is not exactly what you expect to uh, see in QCD. But if you kind of go through the details, you find out that it looks actually just by eye, no real difference. So obviously in QCD, these are some matrix of anomalous dimensions mixing quarks and gluons. And you have this non-vanishing beta function, which you need to take into account. And so this kind of just turns a pure power law into some integral over the coupling, uh, which is kind of schematically shown here, plus some higher order corrections. And so these are kind of quantitatively important details, um, particularly at small j, where the kind of anomalous dimensions are of the same order of the beta function. But as you go to higher points, um, these quickly win over the beta function. And in particular, if you look at them in terms of these ratios of the endpoint over two points scaling, you see that these behave more or less in QCD exactly like you would see in a CFT. So obviously the exact shape is a little bit different because of the beta function, but by eye, these behave kind of qualitatively. So these curves will get steeper and steeper as you go to a higher and higher number of points. And so this is something that we'll be able to just very clearly by eye see in the LHC data. So this is kind of a nice thing that it behaves exactly in QCD as it would in um, a CFT. So the one, um, kind of where things get a little bit, I don't know, maybe less or a bit trickier is if one tries to look for a transverse spin J equals two. So obviously you would also like to be able to see um, the scaling of these operators. And so with unpolarized beams, the easiest way to see these higher transverse spin operators is to take some higher point function. So for example, here's a, the three point function shown here. You can squeeze two of the points together and take this OPE limit. And then as you rotate one point around another by some angle phi, you'll be sensitive at leading twist to these um, spin two operators. 
And so the problem is that if you plug in the explicit values for these OPE coefficients, um, first of all, you find that they're very small. So this is, for example, the contribution of if I squeeze two of these gluons and rotate them. First of all, they're very small compared to the spin zero um, contributions. And so the reason that they're smaller is because you have to have positive energy efficiently and using um, computationally fast algorithms started in um, 08, 02 by these authors here. And so this was like two weeks before the conformal collider physics um, here. And so at that time, it was not possible really to be able to do this. But now that these things are developed, we can really um, kind of actually uh, make this a reality at the LHC. Okay. And so how am I, since I'm not an experimentalist, the way that we can actually just go in and look at this is to use some open data, which is referred to what's called open data, which was released by the CMS um, collaboration. And so this is something that it's a very a minuscule amount of data. And so it can obviously be done much better by the experimentalists. But for these JET studies, it's kind of sufficient. And the point is that we can kind of use this ourselves to illustrate that these are interesting. And then the experimentalists can do it um, themselves kind of much better with actual uncertainties and all the things that you want in a real actual precision uh, measurement. And so for that, I should be very clear that all these kind of measurements are very preliminary. And so that's why I'll primarily focus on these things which are very clear to see by eye. And so they're not some artifact, um, they're not like precision measurements um, and these things should be done properly. And so this is done, made available by Jesse Taylor's, Taylor's group at MIT, which, and kind of repackaged this in this um, MIT open data framework that we can use. Okay. Um, so the, there's kind of many, many things you can look at. And so the two that I just want to focus on are first probing the scaling behavior predicted, which is this kind of universal feature of this light ray OPE. And then second, showing that we can just measure the actual shape dependence of these correlators which live on the sphere. And so I'll show this concretely for the three point correlator. But of course, I mean, one can do essentially kind of anything you want with these. And so I don't want to bore you with many, many plots. And so I'll just focus on uh, these two particular uh, aspects in this talk. Okay, so the first thing is the scaling behavior. And so before showing the plot of the scaling behavior, because it requires a little bit of interpretation uh, because of this fact that in QCD, you have this process of confinement, which um, kind of chops off the perturbative evolution that you would have in a pure um, CFT. And so because of this, um, you expect two really qualitatively different regimes in your correlation function. You kind of expect one, which is associated with this um, perturbative evolution. And then you have one where you're really just seeing some hadrons floating off in your detector. And so just depending on um, your background, so I will use this variable um, delta r as the kind of angular separation for theta. And so depending on the literature, there's kind of different people often use this Z, which is one minus cos theta over two. And so obviously there's different Jacobians and it matters which um, you plot in. And so I'll, the plots kind of may be oriented a bit different depending on uh, what you're used to looking at. And so before showing the, the plot in QCD, it's useful to just kind of make a schematic plot of what one might expect based on the fact that you expect at large kind of angles, you'll have this perturbative evolution and then at very small angles, you should just see this transition um, through confinement to this free floating hadrons. And so in, we can just draw um, these kind of limiting behaviors. So as I said, in this weakly coupled conformal theory, you have this scaling uh, shown here. So this should be a one over theta squared associated with the pole of the underlying uh, parton. So if you draw this in some plot, it's just this kind of straight line, which will go on forever because you can just kind of at least perturbatively fragment uh, forever. And of course, this kind of small angle singularity is associated with why we have jets in QCD. So obviously now that we have a finite or confinement, we'll cut you off at some scale. We expect this to um, rapidly transition to some other scaling behavior at very small angles. And so the other kind of limiting behavior, which one can think of, is the behavior of a uniform distribution of energy. And so in this particular choice of variables I have here, this just corresponds to a completely um, flat line, uh, which is shown here. And so this was something which occurred kind of famously in this strong coupling limit of n equals four, 
where instead of producing, or if you have very strong coupling, your kind of um, partonic internal states just fragment so fast that you just get this um, completely pure mush of uniform distribution off at infinity. And so with these two kind of limiting behaviors, one can kind of guess what you should see in um, QCD. And so if you plot this, so on the left is in terms of these kind of more like CFT variables. And then on the right is this, how one typically does it with this Jacobian in um, collider physics. And so you can see that this QCD exactly interpolates between these two kind of behaviors. And there's this transition and you can work out that this is exactly at the scale um, of confinement. And so the nice thing, um, so then this can be translated into this kind of nicer plot over here by multiplying it by this factor Jacobian, which essentially takes this flat distribution here to this um, uh, line shown here. And so the kind of nice thing is because you can really probe it over this orders of magnitude, you can very clearly see this region of perturbative evolution. And so this is where we'll want to look for the um, perturbative scaling behavior. Then at the confinement scale, it just kind of, you can see immediately something very significant happens there, even if you didn't know about confinement. And then you get again over orders of magnitude that is just this perfect behavior free hadrons. And so as you just say, you may also wonder why there's this um, another kink here. And that's because this occurs at R equals 0.5, which is just the size of the jets that we're using. So this is essentially where this small angle um, approximation kind of breaks down and you're really just seeing the kind of structure of the global event and just the size of the jets. But the thing that's kind of very nice is that at these LHC energies, there's kind of this wide perturbative regime where we can really study the anomalous scalings in detail. And so in particular, uh, for here, we'll just focus on um, this region where you really isolated this um, perturbative scaling. And so this is a kind of plot of the anomalous scaling of these energy correlators up to 10 points. So because you have so much um, data, you can kind of do this, you can go crazy. Of course, you could go higher if you were kind of bored. And so this is the real data from this um, experiment. And you can see, so again, I've kind of blocked out these two regions um, here and here where you shouldn't look at it because it's not um, perturbative. And this is this comparison with the kind of predictions which I showed uh, before. And so of course there should be proper things like um, error bars, et cetera on these, but you can see by eye that there's a kind of very good uh, qualitative agreement. So, so these are again, these ratios where you kind of step up in the number of points and here up to N equals 10. And so again, I should emphasize that these would be completely flat if it wasn't, if there were no anomalous dimensions. So this is really the kind of anomalous uh, Lorentzian scaling of these light ray operators as you bring them apart. And so the kind of basic features like the convexity of the anomalous dimensions are clearly seen because these slopes just kind of um, get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so obviously the proper experimental um, um, kind of comparison of these curves, et cetera, um, is ongoing, but I think it's kind of very neat. Then there's obviously kind of very, um, you can see by eye that there's nice agreement and you can really probe um, this structure. And so just one thing I'll, for this audience, it's maybe less worrying, but just um, from a practical perspective, you could be worried still that even though I'm away from this hadronization region, that um, you could be still contaminated by some non-perturbative corrections. And so this is one of the reasons why I actually took these ratios of the scaling to the two point or always to the two point is that it removes some of this residual um, uh, dependence on this hadronization. And so this is just a plot which should be compared kind of with the earlier um, one I showed you of this simulation on partons and what the effect of hadronization is. And you can see that over most of the range, the effect of the hadronization is kind of less than 1%. And so what you're really probing kind of very convincingly is the perturbative evolution of these light ray operators. And so this is kind of very nice. And you could, since it's directly sensitive to just the value of the coupling in theory, it could be used for instance, for precision measurements of the strong coupling if one wanted to um, do that. I have a question. So when you say sure. ratio, is it the two point or the two point to the three halves power? Um, so here it's really to the two points. So, so, um, so that you're really probing like in a, in a conformal theory, what you'd be probing is this gamma N minus gamma um, three. And so any other kind of Jacobian things we've just taken into account. So these curves should really just go like gamma N minus gamma three. But you're sensitive um, to the overall scale of the energy, right? I, I would have thought that if you took it to the three halves power, it would be a little 
less sensitive to the overall energy scale. Okay, so so we're doing a little bit. I've been a little bit um, tricky. So we're doing a, like we're kind of averaging over some of the shape as well. And from this perspective, it seems that one, one, what one wants is just to normalize it to the two point uh, correlator, and then you get it um, with this particular difference of anomalous dimension. But it, I mean, it might be worth trying with other. Um, this was just something we tried. It may well be worth trying it with um, other powers. Um, but yeah, but yeah, for now it's it seemed to be working quite well with this. But I, I mean, there's we can play with. Um, there's many other things we can we can try with these. So. Okay, um, and so scaling is of course nice. And so that kind of verifies the structure of this OPE. Um, but of course, what's kind of maybe more exciting is that one can actually measure the kind of shape dependence of these three point correlators. And so the first correlator with non-trivial shape dependence in the collinear limit is the um, three point correlator. And so depending on how you think about this, um, you can either just say that you have three points and you put one at zero, one at one through scaling and one at Z. And so then it will behave like a CFT four point function. Alternatively, you can think about it as in the kind of standard case, if you just did this with a time like source Q, you'd have three cross ratios. And then you essentially take a light like limit and you'll get one of these will become a scaling variable and you'll have two remaining cross ratios. Or you can just start with some light like source um, characterized by some variable n um, instead of this q and just write down um, that you get two cross ratios. So either way, kind of taking this collinear limit essentially drops you a cross ratio. It makes one variable into a scaling variable and you're left with some single shape um, dependent object. And so this is the object. So the first time this is non-trivial is once you have, when you have three points. And so one would like to kind of measure this and you can really think of this as the kind of um, standard function for a four point um, function, which I'll make more precise later. And so these triangles, if you draw where they can kind of live for this three point correlator, they live in some where they're kind of non-degenerate with, with other triangles. They live in some kind of curved region uh, shown here where the OPE limit is um, down here. And so this is kind of a pain experimentally because it's some weird curved region. And so it turns out that it's nice to kind of blow up this OPE point by mapping this to a square where using some kind of angular variable and radial variable to the approach. And it's a little hard to kind of actually visualize, but this kind of blows up this OPE region to this whole line. And then the different, you can kind of plot it in this um, square plane. And so then you can just kind of go and directly measure these correlation functions which live on the sphere. Um, of these light ray operators, you can measure the exact shape dependence. And so these, if, I mean, they're hard, even if you've spent some time looking at them, but you can kind of, so this is like an equilateral triangle up here. And this is kind of, as I collapse the um, point down, and then this is as I kind of go into the OPE limit over here. And so the exact structure of this, I mean, yeah, it just takes, it just is what it is and takes some thinking about, but the kind of nice um, features, you can really just measure these and then ultimately compare with um, calculations for these um, and really understand the full like kind of multi um, point correlation functions of these observables. And so this is kind of neat because there's not that many cases just period where you can really measure kind of higher point correlation functions um, or correlation functions of light ray operators. And so I don't want to kind of bore you with um, too many of these plots, but the kind of nice feature of these is you really have this in kind of uh, three dimensions with the scaling also. So you can take, for example, any particular shape you want then you can zoom how it scales. You can approach um, kind of the OPE limit and check that it um, goes into the scaling regime. And you can kind of play with all these kind of standard nice things that you expect of correlation functions and really just look at them um, in data. And so it's kind of like having your own little correlation function that you can play with. And it's so, so it's quite fun. And so of course the kind of proper measurements by the experimental collaborations and comparisons, for example, to the calculations and stuff are all um, forthcoming. And so there's kind of much more to come on this front, but hopefully I've convinced you that these kind of big level features of these, you can really just look at in the data and play with, and it's quite, um, quite nice. Okay. So now that we've kind of illustrated that you can actually um, um, kind of measure these higher point correlation functions and really understand these, this motivates one, I mean, beyond this intrinsic interest to actually understand the perturbative structure 
of these um, higher point correlation functions. So for example, this um, three point correlation function uh, shown here. And so unfortunately, unlike amplitudes or correlation functions or something, there's very little explicit perturbative results for these objects. So I showed or I referenced earlier these cases for the two point correlators with some local operator. And then the only other explicit results for these correlators, which are actually for the completely generic case are these um, were in the original paper of Hoffman and Malvasina, where this is a strong coupling expansion. So it starts at kind of one um, where you have a completely uniform distribution on the sphere, and then you have some corrections. But of course, this is kind of qualitatively very, very different from what you expect at weak coupling. And so it's interesting to understand kind of the expansion in the other direction from a more or just perturbative calculations using techniques from just standard calculations of perturbative scattering amplitudes. And so due to this, you can compute these for generic um, configurations, but due to this um, particular phenomenological motivation, here I'll just again focus on this um, multi-point correlation functions in this collinear limit. So you've kind of taken the collinear limit first, but then keep the angles between the objects and the collinear limit um, arbitrary. And so we'll just start for simplicity with the simplest case, which is this um, three point correlator, uh, which is shown here. And so if you just compute this, um, and I'll say a second um, how you do this. So you find that this three point correlator actually turns out to be kind of remarkably simple if you compute it in um, perturbation theory. So this is the result in n equals four and the resulting QCD is a bit more complicated um, as I'll say in a second, but you can see that it, it's kind of, it's fairly compact. It's about the same complexity as for example, the four point correlator of local operators. And so you can see that it depends on two um, weight two functions. So one is this standard or very standard um, from this calculation of correlation functions of local operators, this single valued um, block Wigner. And the second is a bit more unusual. I haven't seen it appear before is this kind of even function shown here. And so this arises from the fact that in these gauge theories, you, when you're in the collinear limit, you have some kind of um, essentially Wilson lines once you take this limit. And so you get this um, slightly different integral structure um, shown here. But this is absent, for example, if you take just like a scalar theory. And so this, this final line is really coming from these um, um, gauge interactions. But other than that, it's kind of an extremely simple uh, perturbative result. And so you can also just compute it once you have this understanding, you can also compute it in any other theory you want. So for example, in real world QCD, it's the kind of same uh, class of functions, but you just get higher derivatives of these um, block Wigner functions. And so because these just obey some differential equation, what this is really doing is adding kind of more singularities in this collapsed triangle limit. So you get higher and higher powers. And so this again, um, so here, this is Z. And so you seeming, you get higher and higher kind of spurious singularities in this collapsed um, triangle limit. Um, and that kind of is what gives the complexity in the real world answer. For, and I don't really understand uh, exactly why. But either, was, other, either way, in kind of N equals four, you get this very simple uh, perturbative result, which is kind of nice to play with. And so just because these are maybe a different object than say scattering amplitudes or correlation functions, it's just worth saying a little bit about how one actually computes this um, in perturbation theory and why it turns out to be um, kind of very simple. So what you're doing with these observables at least perturbatively is you have some set of particles which go out and if they go through your detector, you weight them with the energy and then you integrate over the energy. So essentially you integrate over the energy fraction of the particles but any particles that are observed, so they're kind of stuck in their positions by the correlators, they have the angles of, um, their angles are fixed. And so for example, if you compute this three point correlator at lowest order in perturbation theory, what you get is some integral over the energy of the three different particles, which will go into your detector. You weight them by some energy, and then you just have your matrix element. And so to see why these are very nice, you can just consider some simple kind of invariant, Madel Sam invariant, which would appear in this matrix element. So for example, this one over S123. And so if you just write out what this integral is, you get something like this. So it's just some integral over these omegas with these kind of different um, angles which are fixed on the sphere. And so this is kind of immediately recognized as a Feynman parameter integral where the, like you think of the energy weightings as the Feynman uh, parameters and the ZIJs are the kind of dual coordinates to um, 
the um, loop integral that you want to compute. So if you just kind of draw this in a picture, you have on the left this energy correlator, and then you have some uh, dual Feynman diagram, which is just, um, in this case, the three mass box integral. Um, and so then you can just kind of convert these to known loop integrals and just read off the int, uh, result because the structure of these integrals is kind of obviously very well understood from um, calculations of um, perturbative scattering amplitudes. And so just if you kind of go explicitly through this, what you get for this three point correlator in the collinear limit is you get one piece, which is exactly this three mass um, box. And then the other piece is sensitive to this um, iconal Wilson line, which I mentioned. And so it's just this kind of um, box with one iconal leg. And so if you write it down, it's just really explicitly these integrals with kind of no rational prefactors and you just get um, these objects. And so I think the kind of simplicity of this um, motivates exploring kind of higher perturbative structures of these results. And this is a bit challenging because as you go to higher and higher points, you'll also get higher and higher weight uh, results, but people are very good at these in particular Feynman parameter integrals. And so it should be doable to kind of explore higher points and understand their structure a little bit more. And so I think I'm just about out of time, but in the last just couple of minutes and I'll be brief, I just wanted to show a little bit about how this kind of can interplay with the light ray OPE structure, both as just providing explicit data for the light ray OPE, and then how kind of understanding of the structure from the light ray OPE can feed back into kind of understanding the um, structure in terms of these functions, which is kind of very different, or the kind of perturbative view is very different than this um, light ray OPE um, perspective. And so this collinear limit is obviously the one that's interesting for jet substructure, but it also turns out to be a very simple limit for studying the structure of the light ray OPE. And so in particular for the two point correlator, um, these authors here showed how to organize the light ray OPE into these celestial blocks associated with the action of the Lorentz symmetry on the sphere. And so there they were a bit more complicated because you're really doing the full kind of sphere with some time like um, Q uh, breaking it. But here, because you're using this kind of light-like limit, you're essentially doing it on the plane. And so this really kind of simplifies um, things. And in particular, if you go through the kind of repeat their derivation, but now for this three-point function in the collinear limit, you just find that because of this simplification of taking the limit first, these celestial blocks are really just the kind of 2D uh, conformal blocks, which are living on this kind of plane transverse to the jet. And so the nice thing about this is this kind of perturbative function, which I showed you before, this G of Z and Z bar behaves exactly like a um, two point or like a four point correlator in a 2D CFT. And so in particular, you can use these nice, um, many nice recently developed tricks like the Lorentzian inversion to just read off the spectrum of the light ray or CFT operators, which appear in, these, um, um, in this calculation. And so in particular, you find, for example, it's now analytic in this transverse um, spin variable, which lives on the sphere. And so the kind of, or the thing that is quite nice um, uh, or quite interesting to me, so this is just a, a verification that you, of the um, Lorentzian inversion and the specific values at the um, integer locations where you read them off. But the thing that's quite interesting to me is you have a very interesting interplay between the kind of perturbative structure and the um, kind of structure in terms of these blocks. So for example, although you shouldn't look, you're supposed to just be measuring the pure energy flow. Of course, in your perturbative calculation in QCD, you can tag different partonic final states in terms of their color structures. You can just look at the answer and look at how it breaks up into all these different um, pieces. And so in particular, you can take some um, kind of diagram where you know that by isolating a particular contribution, you'll move, you'll kind of isolate some particular internal uh, partonic state. So for example, in this graph here, you can take the NF um, contribution. Oh, sorry. Um, you can take the NF contribution and you can take its um, kind of squeeze limit and you isolate this particular uh, intermediate gluon here. And so this, you kind of understand what this state is. And in particular, if you do this, you find that only these transverse spin J equals zero and two uh, contribute as you would expect for a gluon. And also you can really just see the leading twist J equals two block completely uncontaminated by um, higher twist contributions. So for example, if you look at the highest spin pieces, which are shown here, 
If you just expand these, you get some coefficients like six sevenths, five sevenths, et cetera. And these are just exactly the expansion of this block coming from this um, uh, transverse spin to leading twist operator. And so of course in N equals four, when you sum over all the different final states you can go into this um, cancels out. But the nice thing is that in QCD, you can really look at this. And from the perspective of the kind of um, transcendental functions, which I showed before, it's a kind of complete mystery why you get, for example, these um, particular coefficients. And so from that perturbative calculation, it's not at all obvious, but from the kind of symmetries and thinking about this OPE structure, it kind of really constrains what you can expect to see um, in these perturbative calculations. And so I think there's kind of a very nice interplay with the kind of perturbative understanding of the structure of these functions. And then the actual, or kind of thinking about it in this completely different way in terms of these, um, in terms of this OPE. And so of course, this is made even more interesting by the fact that you can actually then go out and uh, measure it. Okay, so just to conclude, um, sorry for going a bit over time. So hopefully I convinced you that jet substructure, the LHC, kind of provides a very physical and completely real realization of the OPE limit of these light ray operators. And so for me, this is nice because it kind of builds a bridge between so like these kind of measurements of the LHC and all this nice um, field theory CFT developments that people have been um, doing. So these shapes and multi-point energy correlators, you can kind of just completely measure them at the LHC and it's very nice. And then there's been a lot of recent progress understanding the structure of these matrix elements coming from very different perspectives. So from the CFT and just from these um, perturbative calculations and hopefully there's more to come, um, which I think is quite exciting. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, we have time for questions. Yes, I have a question. Um, I really like the talk. The jet substructure is certainly very interesting um, in terms of exploring. I was wondering if this technique has been compared with other algorithms. I know you showed like Pythia, so you compare with data. I was wondering if you compare with like the anti-KT algorithm and also there's been some recent developments with machine learning, computer vision, like you've shown the heat map. So if there was anything, any work in that direction as well. Yeah, so there's quite a bit in your question. So um, I should say, so first of all, when I did the actual experimental analysis, I was um, completely, um, or I didn't say anything about how this was actually done. So, so these are done using these anti-KT jets that you uh, mentioned. And so it uses all these kind of standard techniques for organizing jets at the LHC to, um, um, to kind of go into it. And I think the second part of your question was maybe um, related to if um, these observables um, have been compared, for example, for their ability to look for new physics to um, let's say machine learning, um, is that the correct I mean, honestly, no, it's just like the efficiency. So like how good is this algorithm compared to like the machine learning algorithms, the new ones that have been coming out in the last few years? So, and so, so when you mean ef efficiency, you mean the efficiency of... Um, of actually finding the substructure of, of any physics. Oh, uh, okay, okay. So these are, there's kind of two, so the main um, kind of focus of, of this talk was on the kind of performing the calculations of these observables and understanding them. And then there's kind of a second step which is using these observables to look for, for example, some signal at the LHC. And so that's something which I did not um, really talk about at all, but I just had this kind of one very basic plot at the beginning. And so this, um, these searches use some um, observable, which is called D2. Um, and it's loosely speaking, some kind of ratio of this three point to two point correlator. Um, it's done a bit differently because it's done event by event, but it, it uses the same basic ingredients. And so that's something that which is quite widely used in the experiment. And when they're doing that, they're using all these anti-KT, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these tricks. And so there's, um, and so what this is kind of doing is allowing one to understand a bit better how to actually perform the calculations of these observables instead of just relying on some, um, on some underlying simulation. And so because this is kind of very recent work, there hasn't been yet detailed comparisons, for example, of these shapes to what is um, 
included in the parton showers. Although in particular for these full structure of these three point correlators, this will be badly computed um, in parton showers. And so this is something which will be interesting to see in the future. Um, if that answers your, yeah. So there's kind of many steps in this. So this is kind of understanding the things at the most basic level. And then the hope is that, I mean, in the future, typically what happens is these are incorporated into the actual searches and it's kind of a loop. Um, and that's already happened with, for example, this um, example of this transverse spin, uh, which I showed down here. Um, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, so this is a case where um, before there were no calculations of this or their kind of interest in this transverse spin. And so it was just not included in the simulations at the LHC. And people were a little worried about this, particularly for the training of these machine learning algorithms that you mentioned, because they can um, pick up on things that aren't there. And then so once you have an understanding of this transverse spin, it was you can use it to calibrate um, or is implemented and calibrated um, in these parton showers. And you can see that there, this is once they've calibrated exactly matches with our calculation, you can check that the scaling matches uh, correctly. And then this can be used, for example, in the next step um, to understand how to exploit it and train machine learning or whatever you want on it. But they are kind of two uh, distinct steps and the next one largely hasn't been done. So it's a bit hard to answer uh, the question, but the hope is that it will feed in and, and make things better. Um, Okay, that's good, but the progress is on the way. And I have another yeah. question. Does it make sense to go into four point OPEs at all? So as I mean, I think the so the four point correlator, I think is, is very interesting. And so for one thing you can do, which is quite nice at four points, is you can, um, for example, squeeze three together and rotate some full shape. And so once you have kind of three, or if you compute the full four point, there's definitely interesting things to do. And also from the light ray OPE perspective. So of course, as you go to more points, there's kind of more of a, of a playground and there's more interesting kind of things you can do. You can rotate different pairs with respect to each other. And I think, yeah, the more you know, the better and it will eventually be exploited in some way for some search. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Uh, Ian, thanks very much for the beautiful talk. Um, I had a quick question about the um, uh, the perturbative computation. Sure. Uh, yeah. Three point function. Yes. Uh, the three point correlator. So you have this expression with these interesting rational prefactors in front of the dialogues and so on that, that yeah. come out of the triangle and the box like integrals. Yes, but exactly. The question is that the the obvious question. Um, uh, when, when we have amplitudes, we know how to understand what those rational prefactors are out in front. Yes. And more generally, we know how to think about the discontinuities uh, of those uh, transcendental functions in terms Absolutely. of- Absolutely, yes. Um, what is understood about the cut structure of these, uh, of these, um, of these uh, light ray correlation functions? Uh, do they sort of, uh, do they dissolve into other things that have light ray interpretations? Are they related to the OPE in some, in some way? Yeah, so there's, I think there's a whole, I think there's very little known, which is why we started wanting to explore. And there's kind of two things which I'll, one can understand or try and understand it purely from a perturbative perspective and then from this light ray OPE perspective. And so if you just, part of the problem is one would obviously like to, for example, just bootstrap this. And what we did not understand at all is the structure of these prefactors. And in particular, I mentioned, it seems that the complexity as you go from like N equals four to like a phi cubed or QCD is you get more and more powers of these um, Z minus Z bar in the denominator. And so QCD, I think you get up to like Z minus Z bar to the 12. And so you get a quite complicated structure. And for some reason in N equals four, this um, removes. And so one reason or one, the kind of amplitudes way of thinking about why they appear is, um, is coming from these, the structure of when you rewrite them in terms of these loop integrals, that effectively what you're getting, um, sorry, because you have some kind of weights here, you can think of these as some kind of numerator factors. And so the actual integral result that you get, I didn't go through this very close, but these integrals, because of these numerator factors are in kind of weird, so they're like in very high dimensions. But of course, for this like triangle integral, it's nicest in four dimensions. And so you just do these weight shifting relations mm -hmm. down to four and you just generate. So if you write it in terms of this eight dimensional object, 
there's zero prefactor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you just differentiate it a bunch and you generate all this kind of crap that goes in the front. And so if you had some way of knowing a, a priori why you can put it in terms of these, um, I think you could much better understand the, the structure of these prefactors because that is the kind of harder thing. But, and but then, maybe, maybe I could even ask, uh, I mean, even without getting it from the, uh, even without trying to get it from first principles somehow, even if you, uh, uh, stop at this intermediate step where you have a representation in terms of these dual integrals. Can yeah. you understand um, what cutting these integrals might mean at the level of the uh, of the um, of the three point function? I mean, I'm just asking whether there's a, there's a intrinsic to the light ray world um, interpretation yes. of the cut. So the short answer is no, or I don't, I would very much like to understand it, but I, yeah, do not. And so for instance, this one over Z minus Z bar factor, this is just like the leading singularity of this piece, but that's really just like an observational um, mapping. And so I think to understand this, what you're asking is the kind of key question. And I, I do not understand it now um, is, the, is the kind of short answer. But kind of by doing these and also seeing how this extends, like let's say to the four point, I think one will start to gain, there's just essentially nothing is known. And so we're just trying to kind of build up um, a little bit of an intuition. Yeah. And then, so it's a bit from the light ray OP, I don't again know what cutting means, but you can do these kind of like putting these on or kind of squeezing. So you're putting certain states on shell with these light ray OPEs. And so like here, uh, it's not exactly a cut, but when you squeeze these um, two shown here, you're obviously just exposing this internal state. And so that's why you can see the kind of block associated with that um, like twist two glue on piece just like appear. And so there's some very interesting because like when you write the result in terms of like Li twos, it, it's like a complete miracle that when you expand it, you get these weird coefficients of this hypergeometric function out. And somehow there should be some better, maybe the Li2 is not the right representation. There should be some way of making this um, more clear because yeah, there's, they're kind of, there's something, yeah. There's some very like, it's very, very constrained. Um, and so, um, and so we're, yeah, we're just kind of at this, the kind of playing around with these different angles with the hope of better understanding. But yeah, the short answer is, very little is known. Yeah. One more super naive question. Um, yeah. Often, what happens for amplitudes when you when you look at the the uh, the appropriate super amplitude, sometimes a lot of the uh, crap out in front just gets swept up into some Suzy stuff, and so you don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is, is it is it conceivable? Is there is there a more naturally supersymmetric object or a super three point correlator that? Simplifies I think, the, the prefactors, or are we really living with these non-unit leading singularity objects? As uh, I think we're living. I mean, there that's may what be. What it looks like, but yeah, it looks like because, we're living with them. You're living yeah, with them. because so I should say there's already some. Um, so so like when you do this energy correlator, you should really just be summing over all states that go through the um, end result. Right. And so even if you take the n equals four results for I didn't show it, but if you compute it for like if you just restrict to some like scalar in the final state or some particular subsets, this thing is way more hideous. And then it really simplifies down when you do the sum over all the um, states. And so my guess is that this is the, um, this is essentially as simple as one can make it. But one way of further simplifying it, which may be useful to understand the structure is so in a gauge theory, you have to like weight by the energy. And this kind of adds these numerator factors and makes the integrals worse. If you just go to like phi cubed, because it doesn't have these singularities, you can just compute like the number correlator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then this object is much nicer. Um, and so it may be that one wants to like play around in like phi. So we've also, I mean, it's, they're easy to compute in phi cubed. So phi cubed removes like these pieces and you just essentially get these box functions. And if you go to like the number correlator, it's, it's like, it's like one line, it's like a box function plus something. And so it may be that like um, there's just some intrinsic complexity by putting these additional weights in the front which generate these for you, but you have to go to some other type of correlator which is nicer. Um, but yeah, the, sh the short answer is there's almost, or there's almost nothing known and it's kind of very, I mean, sad compared to the level of complexity for amplitudes or something. And so, but of course there's wonderful techniques from amplitudes and so we should be able to I mean, compute more of these and understand, hopefully. Yeah. Chris? 
Hi, thanks. I it was a wonderful talk. I, I now I'm starting to feel bad. I I didn't listen to Juan and Diego when they had mentioned to this many years back. But the uh, um, one thing I was wondering is you show you know sort of what you call unfolded distributions. Um, okay. Did it? Did you see the features you wanted to see before you unfolded? Yeah, yeah, good. So this is a very good question, and I, yeah, if you had, I might have been a bit more careful in showing these plots if I'd known you were here. So, um, so again, this this unfolding is done. So Jesse Thaler and they've recently done this, and Ben Nockman. Um, so they've done this omnifold where it's unfolded with some machine learning algorithm. But this should really be these should be kind of with many asterisks on them. Um, yeah, the only thing I would just uh, keep an eye out for is, is to see whether, you know, the patterns are there before. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so this so, is part of the reason why we took these um, ratios. Right. Is that in the ratios, it's, it's like a, it's a very small shift um, when you go from unfolding to unfolding, or sorry, folded, unfolded, if you, if you don't unfold, it's a very, very small shift for uh -huh. these particular things. Yeah. And so I mentioned a bit earlier, these like spin correlations, which in QCD are like the few percent level. And so one of the reasons why we're not looking for those is that there you actually have to be really careful that there's not some other um, effect. And so the things I showed here, we wanted to look for things that you can like eyeball and there's nothing like- Yeah, no, it, it, looks, um, it looks really interesting. And in fact, yeah. when we design detectors, we, we decide what the smallest delta are you can measure yeah, yeah, yeah. But it actually helps us a lot but the one thing i was just curious just very quick so i mean these are the, you have to know the i assume you're tr you're getting a list of particle momenta extrapolated back to the primary vertex you know because you don't you want to be able to get charged and neutral and and you don't want the bending of the magnetic field and then there must be some energy thresholds for the particle i'm just just in general terms What's your penalty for missing particles? You know, yeah. so, you so have maybe, this energy waiting, but you know, some of those energies have, might be small and some big. Yeah, good. So, so maybe I'll say one thing, which for, for experimentally is very nice about these correlators is that you can actually measure them. You can compute them on tracks. So just on charged particles. And so that's what allows us or what allows to go to such good angular resolution. And even though this is something that's not infrared safe in QCD, it turns out that you just have to wait the answer by what is called like a track function, which converts um, the kind of perturbative calculation okay, perfect. That's just a I moment. Want. And so once you're doing it on tracks, then things are much, much better. And so this is actually a, like a big advantage. So some of these other jet substructure observables, when you try and go to very small angles, you run into all these problems you were asking about that you're just using calorimetry and there you actually really have to worry about um, those issues you raised. But here you can just do it on tracks. And then again, so I'm not an experimentalist, but when I talk to my like friends like Ben Nachman or something, they assure me that tracks can be done kind of very nicely to small angles. Yeah, they can. And there's not, yeah, yeah and there's not good. much to worry about. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Peter. Hi, thanks for the talk. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask how, realistic do you think is to get so we're talking about this reading twist contributions yeah 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 how, how, how realistic do you think it, it is to get like some sub reading contributions compared to that maybe from the shape dependence that you're showing here yeah it's good so i think i mean to reproduce the full shape dependence you obviously need these and so if you take like so that's why i think this is more in i mean more interesting and so this shape dependence can be measured in quite some detail and then if you look at a generic point in the middle like I didn't show this, but you can take, for example, like cuts, sorry, my, the color is bad, um, but you can take like cuts across this and look at like the structure. And if you do this at some generic point, like in the middle, like for an equilateral triangle, here you're really probing the full um, set of like everything that appears in the OPE. And so here we haven't done like the comparison yet because it's, it's hard, first of all, for the one has to be a bit, it should probably be done by a proper experimentalist but it's also just like confusing to look at it in detail, but we've taken some of these slices. And so here, I think you can show, like if you're in this um, equilateral region that a standard, like, I don't know if you, so a standard part on shower is based on like one to two splittings. And so you can essentially think of it as like leading twist. And so in this region where you have like an equilateral triangle, you'll be able to show that the like leading twist part on shower fails. And so you'll definitely be able to see that the like, 
that you need the higher twist pieces. Um, you, you probably won't be able to see, like, you're not gonna be able to tell exactly what they are, but you'll be able to see that you need them to get the correct answer. And then you should be able to com like compute the full answer and compare it to it. So I think from these shape dependence in particular in this like close to equilateral regime, for example, as you like fold the triangle down, if you took some slice up here, you should be able to see that it differs from just having leading twist for sure. Um, yeah. So you're so saying like you wouldn't be able to tell exactly what, like you don't think it, there is enough like precision to you know look at the plot and say, okay, well, these are the operators that are, that we need, but maybe you can go the other way and compare some. Yeah, so I, th I think you won't be able to, I mean, just because you're, it's gonna kind of go from a regime where you need all the operators um, to a regime, like the transition, I mean, you might be able to, if you really looked at it closely, move from some like fully equilateral and then start squeezing into this limit and see that it like, you should be able to see that it goes from being well described in the squeeze limit by just the leading twist. And then maybe in the middle, you can see that it will be okay when you add like one operator in or something as you can kind of like extrapolate away. But um, I think probably what you'll actually be able to see is that it, it like fails if you just put the leading twist when you're over here and then you can just compute the full thing and see that it works. And then the leading twist should work in the um, OPE region. Um, but yeah, that's my kind of best hope, I think, yeah. I guess like part of the reason I'm asking, I'm just trying to understand. So, you know, if you look at this two point correlator, then the OP is kind of very clean in the sense that, you know, you, you showed us, you take this limit and you see that there is like the scaling. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when you start talking about the shape dependence, in some sense, I'm wondering whether there is a benefit to thinking about OP as compared to just taking, you know, you, computing it perturbatively with the full correlator directly and uh... so yes yeah, so, so good so I think there is so I think there is a benefit one of the reasons why I think there's a benefit is that in the real like when you actually compare it to data you have to perform the resummation in this squeezed um, limit and so if you have an understanding of like the blocks that appear there and how they resum then this will make the transition. So you can kind of compute it perturbatively at some absolute fixed order where you have the completely like, or just for generic correlators. And then as you bring two together, you have to start performing like to agree with data, like the resummation, because in QCD, you don't just put the like Z to the gamma, you need some to do the like renormalization group. And so to understand the structure of, if you understand the structure of the blocks and how this resums, it should allow you to kind of interpolate nicely between the full like just fixed order and this limit and so we actually i mean we've played a little bit um in looking like just putting in the blocks and looking at how well like if you put a few of these blocks it approximates pretty good the overall angular distribution um even as you go away from the origin and so i think having some of these or having an understanding of the blocks i think is quite um useful but obviously you, you want to also compute it perturbatively but I mean, in some sense, the more you know, the better. Um, okay, yeah, or you could imagine that like, if you did some higher point correlator, you might not know the full thing, but if you can just put in a few blocks and if you know that that kind of agrees very well, then you're kind of good to go. And so that's why I think the blocks are, are very nice. Um, yeah. Nice feature also is that they, they're, they're Lorentz and blocks. So yeah, 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 yes. So, so they're, no, I think they're practically useful, yeah. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, uh, we can thank Ian again, and uh, we'll meet again at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, if you don't have the link uh, for the next meeting at 4 p.m., it's a different Zoom link, you can email me and I can send you the link. So if you, if you are all invited. So. Okay, thank you very much.